Welcome to the UKCPA and Thrombosis UK uh, Perioperative Management of Anticoagulation uh, webinar today. Um, the aim of uh, this session will be to introduce you and make it more comfortable for you to get used to, to use the perioperative management of anthropotic therapy, uh, which is re recently uh, published by the, um, the ACCP uh, in August. Um, we will have three. We will have three uh, presenters today. Two, three speakers. We have Rosalind Byrne, who is a principal pharmacist at King's College. Uh, welcome, Rosalind Rose. We will have a, followed by Catherine Sterling, who is a consultant pharmacist in Leeds, and then we'll end we end up with um, uh, Dr. Alice Burridge, who is associate director of pharmacy uh, in Coventry. And uh, we will um, we will have a few questions at the end of the um, of the sessions, but feel free to ask questions in the chat. We will try to uh, group them at the end and, uh, and and answer as many as possible. If there are too many questions, we'll keep them and we'll reply on the UKCP on the UKCPA hat um, forum later on. So our first speaker with Rose is going to introduce the the guideline. Thank you, Rose. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um... Okay, next slide please, thank you. So I'm going to basically talk through the ACCP guidance, um, any differences um, that to practice that they will make um, and focusing on the anticoagulation part rather than the antiplatelet part. Uh, next slide please. Okay, so these are the guidelines. It's the American College of Chest Physicians guidelines that were published in August this year. Um, they updated them because the last guidance guidelines are quite old from 2012 and there's been substantial new evidence since then, although they do um, say that uncertainty still remains, as you will see. Approximately 15 to 20 percent of patients receiving anticoagulation will require a surgical procedure annually. So obviously this is quite an issue um, that we need to address. And the aim of perioptive um, anticoagulation um, management is to deliver individualized patient-centric care with the intent of minimizing perioperative thromboembolism and bleeding. Now, if you first take a look at the summary recommendations of these guidelines, you would think potentially that um, they're recommending that we should scrap bridging for most patients. But actually, if you read the full guideline, um, there's a bit more nuance than that. And there are quite a few patients for which, as you will see as I go through it, um, that they are still recommending bridging. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So the first thing we do when we're thinking about whether or how we need to manage a patient who needs perioperative management of their anticoagulation is to uh, risk stratify them for their thromboembolic risk. So ACCP have categorized them into high, moderate and low risk uh, patients. So as you would expect, I think there's not much of a surprise here. Um, the high risk patients include any mitral valve, any old valve, um, and stroke and TIA in the last three months. This is for the valve patients. And then for AF, I think the only change for us would be that we usually risk stratify on CHADS 2, which has become confusing because most people use CHADS VASC now. So actually, including a CHADS VASC score by which someone becomes high risk is very useful. So patients with a CHADS VASC score equal to or over seven would count as high risk, obviously with stroke or TIA in the last three months and rheumatic valve disease. And then for VT patients, I think this is pretty similar to how it's always been VT in the last three months and severe thrombophilia and um, antiphospholipid syndrome. It's worth um, noting that obviously the type of surgery can affect the thromboembolic risk as well. And also that in terms of practical guidance, ACCP actually only really have two categories, even though there are three categories for thromboembolic risk. So you'll see later that in terms of practical guidance, there are two categories, low to moderate and high, are the two categories. <coughs> Sorry. And next slide, please. And then the next thing we need to look at is the surgical bleeding risk. So this is categorized into high, low, moderate and minimal. And for high risk surgeries, we need to have no residual anticoagulant effect. There's a, this is based on the ISTH guidance statement from 2019, um, and there's a massive list of types of surgeries. This is a sort of a simplified version of that table, but it's the surgeries you would expect for high risk. So major cancer surgery, major orthopedic surgery, any surgery um, involving spinal epidural, epidural anesthesia. Um, and then the minimal um, so risk categories for surgery, those, these surgeries would be 
um, safe on full anticoagulation. So those kind of surgeries will be minor dermatological, dental procedures, cataract surgery type of procedures. Obviously, some surgeries move around categories depending on the clinical circumstance. So, for example, if you're undergoing colonoscopy for a patient who had history of polyps, for which you may need to perform polypectomy, then the risk, the bleeding risk of the surgery may increase. Um, OK, next slide, please. So this, nothing much has changed for warfarin in terms of we are all used to stopping warfarin five days prior to surgery to allow INR to normalize for high risk patients. Um, they do advise to resume after 24 hours post-surgery, um, bearing in mind that it takes at least two to three days for um, warfarin to start working again. Um, and, to, and they do specify to start at the normal dose, the patient's normal dose of warfarin rather than loading to reduce the risk of bleeding post-op. So that um, is more specific guidance there for warfarin. So I'm just going to go through the different um, categories of patients that we normally see. So next slide, please. So mechanical heart valves. I think when you first read the guidance, the main recommendation for mechanical heart valves is that ACCP advise against use of heparin bridging, which is quite a change in practice, I think, from what most people are doing at the moment. Um, this is based on the PERIOP. Two trial, which had 21% of patients with mechanical valves, 9% mitral, 12% aortic. Um, they compared deltaparin versus placebo for bridging and found no difference in outcome for major bleeding or thromboembolism. Um, other observational studies have shown an increase in major bleeding for bridging um, patients with mechanical valves. So this is where the guidance comes from, but it is a conditional recommendation and there is a low certainty of evidence. And the caveat is, of course, they do advise bridging for older style valves, um, mechanical mitral valves with additional risk factors. Patients have had an event, that should say, sorry, in the last three months, and patients have had a prior perioperative thromboembolism. So it's not a huge change for the high risk valves, but I think we are um, at the moment bridging most valves, I would say, in fact, probably all. And I think that will, it, it, to change this, to, to change to not bridging aortic valves essentially um, would require a conversation with the cardiothoracic surgeons. And I imagine there will be some resistance to not bridging because to be honest, we've only just managed to switch from bridging with heparin infusions to lemonic heparin. So it may take some time to make that change if we do. Uh, next slide, please. So AF patients is pretty much, I think what we're currently doing um, the bridge trial at bridging versus no bridging for AF patients have found a threefold increase in major bleeding, no difference in arterial thromboembolism, and periop to similarly, no difference in major bleeding or arterial thromboembolism. So this is str a strong re recommendation with moderate certainty of evidence against bridging for AF patients. However, um, they do advise bridging for Chasvask over seven equal to over seven or TIA or CVA in the last three months, which I think is pretty much what most people have been doing for AF patients. It's certainly what we've been doing. Um, next slide, please. So VT patients, this, there's not a huge amount of evidence for this group of patients. Um, so ACCP advised is against bridging, but again, it's a conditional recommendation with low certainty of evidence. Um, they advise bridging for patients in the, who had VT in the last three months, especially in the last month, which makes perfect sense. Um, patients with severe thrombophilia, um, antiphospholipid syndrome and active cancer. Um, I think this probably does change our practice slightly if we are to um, go along with this recommendation in terms of patients that have had VT in the last three to 12 months, who we tend to bridge probably at the moment. And that is not what ACCP are recommending for most patients in that category. Next slide, please. So for heparin, um, this is what well, standard practice really, so stop heparin four hours prior to surgery, resume over 24 hours post-surgery without a bolus and at a, a lower APTR target is the recommendation for an ACCP. I think that's very cautious and possibly not, we possibly won't wait that long depending on the surgery, but obviously it's a conversation um, with the surgical team. And um, for low, mole low molecular weight heparin, as we do last dose of 24 hours prior to surgery, and then there's a recommendation to use a half dose of low molecular weight heparin the day before a high risk feeding procedure. 
I know some people do do this, but we actually don't. Um, this is an approach that's taken in Bridge and in Periop 2, and it was associated with reduced rates of perioperative bleeding. So this is something that we might look at changing in our um, perioperative protocol. Um, for high-risk patients to resume after 48 to 72 hours, and importantly, for high thromboembolic risk patients to give thromboprophylaxis in the interim, I think this often gets missed. So patients who seem to be not needing thromboprophylaxis because they're on anticoagulation normally, but it's not actually being restarted. And then from, um, thromboprophylaxis gets forgotten. So that's extremely important. Even if you can't resume full dose anticoagulation to think about VT risk assessment and whether thromboprophylactic doses are uh, safe and needed. Okay, next slide, please. So DOAX, probably most importantly, given that we're using so many, so much of them at the moment. So the pre-op interruption interval is based on four to five elimination half-lives and no bridging is needed for patients on DOAX, as we know. So they're recommending for high bleeding risk procedures to miss at least two full days prior to surgery, which equates to a 60 to 68 hour interval from last dose to surgery. Um, this probably is a slight difference from what we do because we would probably give the last dose 48 hours prior rather than leave two full days. So that's something we would need to look at. Look at. It's um, sort of open to, in, has previously been open to interpretation, but it's a bit more um, prescriptive in the ACCP guidance. And then for high-risk bleeding procedures to resume the diet at 48 to 72 hours. Um, and again, consider whether thromboprophylaxis is needed. Um, and for low to moderate risk bleeding procedures to miss one full day, which equates to 30 to 36 hour interval from last dose and resume at 24 hours. And um, the caveat being patients with on dibigotram with creatinine clearance less than 50, where you leave a longer interval, um, two days for low moderate risk, four days of high risk. And for patients with a creatinine clearance, uh, low creatinine clearance on rivaroxaban, adoxaban and apixaban. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a little bit clearer on this, um, diagram from the ACCP guidance just shows exactly when to stop um, the different diets based on um, uh, creatinine clearance. Um, and also makes the point about thinking about using um, thromboprophylaxis if you're not going to restart um, with the diac immediately. Next slide, please. So this was mostly came from the poor study, which was a study that looked at, well, asked the question, is a standard perioperative management approach safe for AF patients using DOACs and who require elective surgery or procedure? So they looked at 3,000 AF patients and 33% of those patients were undergoing high bleeding risk procedure. And this approach was associated, the approach which is basically on the last slide was associated with low rates of major bleeding and arterial thromboembolism. They did exclude patients with low creatinine clearance um, but this is basically what um, the ACCP have based their DOAC guidance on. Um, we have been, well, I've been involved in helping with the update of the UK CPA perioperative handbook. So this is a really useful resource for anything perioperative, but there's a particular section on um, anticoagulation um, and it's currently being updated based on new guidance, guidance and new evidence, and it should be available, the new update very soon. So that's just a link to that, um, that was very useful. Um, and I will hand over to Catherine now, thank you. Thanks very much, Ros. Thanks for that wind down. I've got a few questions myself, I think, after the end of that. But I think um, it does make you question some of your practices. And I think one of the things I really got from there was how we all confuse bridging and VTE prophylaxis and sort of use them quite interchangeably. But actually, they are separate things. And though we might not use bridging, we still need VTE prophylaxis post-surgery. And I think that's um, definitely something that we've found um, in, in our cases. Um, um, and... The other thing I was going to say was I've never seen a patient get back into range on morphine after two to three days. And I'm always quite surprised at how people quickly people think it works, um, because sometimes we can be two weeks, even on even with boosting and on their usual dose before it comes back into range. And I, I do that gives me some concern when people keep patients off, for, you know, and don't give them profile up. BTE prophylaxis, for example, or bridging that people can be up, can be not anticoagulated for quite a long time. So, a few questions to uh, to think about there. So, um, I'm moving on to talk about the preoperative anticoagulation management, just using a couple of cases and things from our experience in Leeds um, around uh, things that we felt was important, really, for for patients to um, 
for, for, for healthcare professionals to communicate to patients. So if you can have that first slide, or next slide. So obviously as, as well as, uh, as talked to in the ACCP guidance um, and in the um, BSG um, endoscopy guidelines and things as well, continuing warfarin um, is obviously an option for patients um, where we can manage um, the surgery with that. So cataracts, dermatology, certain diagnostic um, endoscopy procedures as well. Patients do need to have an INR done fairly recently prior to their procedure. Um, we had a dermatology clinic that did, um, that uh, removed BCCs and did other dermatological procedures. And they always wanted an INR three days before the clinic and they did laser surgery on a Monday. <laughs> and they always wanted it below 2.5. But it became very difficult for these patients who turn up on a Friday afternoon for an INR, it was 2.8 and then they go, oh no, we're not doing it. And, and you could never really find a derm dermatological dermatologist on a Friday afternoon to ask what to do. Um, so making sure that an INR is done before the procedure is really important, but making sure it's done in a timescale where you can adjust the dose or ask the patient to miss some doses prior to the procedure so that it can still go ahead and it's not cancelled and you're not wasting everybody's time. Um, with that, it's really important. So for our endoscopy patients, they say to have an INR done seven days prior to the procedure. Um, dermatology still they say three days, but they don't do procedures on a Monday now. Um, and will also allow a little up to five days as well. So that's made it a bit easier um, for patients. We had a patient a few weeks ago who was attending for an endoscopy. The INR two weeks before the procedure was in normal range, but they missed the one seven days before the procedure because they had COVID and couldn't come for their procedure, uh, their, their INR check and were also on antibiotics. When they came for the procedure, their INR was four and they wouldn't do it. And they said, oh, we'll need to bridge for next time. They obviously can't manage the war for it. I was like, probably the COVID and the antibiotics that pushed it up and the fact that we hadn't got a plan for this patient. Um, so may, we made a plan for the next time and actually managed uh, to keep the patient on the warfarin. And um, they're very scared of injections as well, which wasn't, um, so it was better to, to keep them on the warfarin if we could do. And just making, uh, checking with regular monitoring um, for those that procedure. So, Thinking about, you know, if we have got a patient that's on warfarin, just making sure they're aware of the procedure, they're aware when to get an INR checked. Um, our results show up on our electronic patient records so everybody can see them, but obviously other clinics they don't or at the GP, so making sure the patient's got a record of that result um, visible for when they have their, their procedure. Um, in the case of our dermatological procedures, making sure they don't do them on a Monday and want an INR three days before, so thinking about the time of the week that they're doing those procedures, if they've got patients on warfarin, how can we manage that so that we can keep patients on their warfarin, still therapeutic, and they can still go for their procedure um, as well is obviously uh, important there. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so when patients, stopping patients anticoagulation um, and without bridging, um, obviously the communication of that is really important. You have to remember that some patients have been told never to stop their anticoagulation. So they're really quite nervous about procedures and stopping their anticoagulation and what that means for them. Um, so sometimes just a phone call going, yeah, just stop five days before and, and we'll sort it out is, is needs a little bit more backup. We often get patients where they've had that and then they've come for the INR check and really worried about it. Um, so obviously we'll try and either um, explain to them or um, if they're really, really concerned, discuss with um, the consultant, the, the surgeon about, about what to do. Um, some patients where they've had recurrent BTEs, where they may, maybe don't fit the guidelines for bridging uh, to consider BTE prophylaxis. And some patients have really wanted to have something rather than nothing, um, as long as they've had their dose, last dose 12, at least 12 hours before the procedure for their BTE prophylaxis, that, that doesn't, um, usually wouldn't preclude anything obviously check your own guidance for details but that has been something we've used at times so maybe patients have had a number of VTE events around surgery as well um, and VT prophylaxis is appropriate but that isn't covered in ACCP because it is all about bridging there. Um, the other thing around uh, stopping anticoagulation and I know there's a question in the chat that I know that we'll, we'll cover later is around restarting and things so for patients that have stopped it and they're having their endoscopies we always say check with the team we're not there at the time of surgery I don't know how much they've bled or how much they're going to bleed or whether they're going to bleed at all so it's about empowering them um, to, to check with the team that's managing their surgery their procedure around restarting um, and asking them about about that as well we've definitely had some mixed messages from 
done there. So patients that have been bridged prior to surgery, well, after surgery, they've gone, oh, just restart your warfarin. You don't need any of the, you don't need any bridging. You don't, don't have the injections as well. And we've ended up with valves that have been off it for 10 days before they've come back into range. So just empowering the patient, communicating with the patient of what to expect and who to ask, for example, for guidance. Because you know, we, before a procedure, have got no idea what's going to happen there, whether you're... Um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy becomes an open and, and much bigger surgery but ensuring that the patient feels confident to ask about what to do next um, is really important. Next slide please. Um, we can probably all recount patients that haven't managed their anticoagulation appropriately around surgery because they've got confused or they've forgotten or they just carried on taking the warfarin because it was still in the box that their family member had done and things. Um, we, when we see patients for bridging, we give them a letter with it full details and try to go through it in clinic where we can. A lot of our bridging patients in the, in the pre-op assessment area aren't seen face to face. And I definitely think that's definitely been a, a problem. It's much easier to explain things face to face for patients. Um, that was all changed because of COVID, um, hoping to get back to a bit more face-to-face. -face. But in the warfarin clinic, we do see them and we can give them a letter at that time and go through it. So think about when to stop the warfarin and when to start the low molecular weight heparin. Um, can they self-inject the low molecular weight heparin? Um, as, as Ross talked about, you know, in terms of dosing and times of dosing, we always say eight o'clock in the morning so that they have the last dose 24 hours before the procedure. But if you're needing to use someone else, just your nurses, practice nurses, they often can't do it at that time. So how can we manage that? I think the half dose the day before, which we do sometimes do, but I would say probably not as maybe as often as we should be thinking about. Um, at least potentially that can be given slightly later. But um, again, still need to think about how can, can the patient manage the lemon aquat heparin. We've definitely had patients who won't have it and have ended up coming into clinic first thing in the morning for us to give um, as well. So what how how can people manage? Can we can we help them to self-inject? Is there anyone else that can do it? And if the timings are important, what what can we do to make sure that they don't have a dose too close to their procedure and then that gets cancelled as well? And I think the other thing that we get a lot of queries around is if the procedure's cancelled, what should they do? Um, you know, cancelled at the last minute because there's a lack of theatre slot, lack of HDU bed because they haven't managed their anticoagulation appropriately, hopefully very few of those, because um, we do try and do a lot of work to ensure that works well. Um, but, you know, now we, we, have, we can get a patient four days later phoning going, oh, it's been cancelled. We didn't know in the warfarin clinic and, and they hadn't been given any, um, any plan um, there. So making sure that, you know, that there is a plan put place for cancellation, that if the patient's cancelled, that they've got, they, they ask the team what to do um, to, get, to get some advice. I think there's a whole other section isn't there around when the patient's cancelled but is rebooked for maybe two weeks time do they stay off their anticoagulations do they stay on bridging do they need some prophylaxis you know because actually you're going to leave that patient off for quite a long time which is another consideration maybe as well so there's a lot of um there's a lot of um quiz there still can be quite a lot of questions a lot of management to do around these patients to make it safe i think there's a lot of work going on obviously as we're trying to reduce the list waiting list that happened due to COVID. There's a lot of pressure to get people through quickly, but that's when mistakes happen, isn't it? And it's about making sure patients uh, have a plan that they understand and they can manage um, to try and ensure that they can safely have their surgery when it's booked for, um, and that obviously there's no, there's no cancellations. Next slide, please. So just as a summary, ensuring the patient's aware of the plan, it's well documented, whether that's done by the endoscopy nurses, by the warfarin clinic, by the pre-assessment clinic, by somebody, making sure that that's, that's documented um, and that there's, the patient has the, the details. A plan for cancellations as well, or the patient knows who to contact. There we have a little caveat on the bottom of our letters saying, if the patient just cancelled, ask your team and, and or contact us. Um, Making sure, and I haven't made this clear already, making sure patients don't have anticoagulation on the morning of the procedure. We've definitely had patients who've come in going, oh yeah, have I an oxyparin this morning? And they're like, well, that's cancelled then, isn't it? Um, so ensuring that they do know not to take anything on the day of the procedure, prior to the procedure. Um, thinking about for those that can't self-inject, what other options we've got, especially if we're giving doses in the mornings of the day, the days before surgery, making sure that we're not, you know, that. Um, the only time they can get in is 4 p.m. We don't want them having a full dose of lemon liquid heparin at that point if their operations the next day. So what other things can we do? Can we give a half dose or a prophylactic dose the day before? Um, and just to be aware that some patients are really frightened about stopping their anticoagulation. They might have had a VTE in the past when that's happened. 
they might have been told never to stop it and there's someone who hangs on to those words um, and things so I'm sure they can discuss the concerns with a healthcare professional whether that be in the anticoagulant service or at the um, uh, within the pre-assessment service or the surgeon as well there. So um, yeah, just some things to think about for pre-operatively. Um, if I have the next slide, please. Alice is going to talk about post-operative management. Thank you, Alice. Hi, thanks, Catherine and Roz. So as they've both alluded to before, sometimes the post-operative period can be one where there's a bit more of an area for debate. Often, whoever's provided the initial advice in terms of the perioperative management is not there at the point of the post-procedure. Um, and there is maybe some more clinical judgment required from the team in place with the patient at that time. So I'll talk you through um, an example from our organisation. And this is something that's maybe happened a couple of times now. So um, if we can have the next slide, please. So um, as Roz and Catherine have spoken through already, so this is a patient that's had a history of um, unprovoked PE. He's on regular anticoagulation because of that. He's coming in for a TURBT and the pre-op management has been agreed as to stop his Apixaban 48 hours pre-procedure. So looking at the latest ACCP guidance, this is probably in line with that. If we look at the thrombosis risk, there's no mechanical valves. The patient doesn't have AF. Their PE might have been over 12 months ago, but they do have active cancer, so they probably fall into that, maybe the moderate thrombosis risk. And then again, looking at the bleeding aspect of the procedure, um, with most um, urology related procedures, usually we consider those higher risk of bleeding. So it seems reasonable that the pre-op plan is to stop the PIC span 48 hours before. And as we've said before, with patients on DOAX, there's no bridging requirement. Um, so if we can have the next slide, please. So in terms of after this type of procedure, um, often these patients may have a bit of minor hematuria, um, and this can be something that's subjective and requires the input of the clinical team. So it's important that the surgeon or their team has some input so you, we understand the severity of this. So um, they might may well need to have whoever the junior doctor is on the ward, have a look at the patient, have they checked their HB to see if this is actually significant. And then we consider after this procedure, what are our options in terms of anticoagulation now? So as you can see, there's four options on the screen here. So it's not necessarily a straightforward decision. Um, in terms of this patient with some minor hematuria, we would probably say it's not appropriate to restart your full anticoagulation immediately. And particularly, as we know, this is a procedure that's associated with a higher risk of bleeding. And then we come to the the other two options. So should this patient have no anticoagulation at all or should they be having VTE prophylaxis? And generally within our organization with a higher bleeding risk procedure, we wouldn't consider starting full anticoagulation. So either the apixaban or a treatment dose low molecular weight heparin until 48, 72 hours afterwards. But what do we do in that interim period before we can start the treatment dose anticoagulation or restart the DOAC? So as we've alluded to before, it's important that you follow your local procedures in terms of your VTE risk assess assessment at this point. And it's likely that this patient will probably require VTE prophylaxis um, before they can restart their usual anticoagulation. So in this scenario, we would often give the first dose of prophylaxis um, eight to 12 hours after their procedure and then continue that in our organisation with anoxaparin once daily until their surgeon or the surgical team are happy with the hemostasis and if the hematuria is um, resolved at that point we would restart their full anticoagulation at that point. So thinking about generally with the DOAX access we find most patients is that's the most common option of anticoagulation these days for low bleeding risk procedures often our patients would have one dose of VT prophylaxis eight to 12 hours after their procedure and then 24 hours if it's a low bleeding risk procedure they would often restart their full anticoagulation and then like these urology patients where their bleeding risk is probably higher they would maybe have up to two or three days of VG prophylaxis before um, restarting their full anticoagulation. Um, so then the, the next thing to consider is making sure that if the patient remains an inpatient, that the communication is clear as to when their regular anticoagulation is to restart. And obviously at that point, if they're restarting their apixaban or 
River Oxfam that their um, low molecular heparin is stopped. That's often an area we need to be cautious of, whether you've got electronic prescribing or paper-based prescribing. It seems that whichever system, that's an area of risk when we're switching between the different anticoagulants. And then if your patient is only in for a short period of time, they're making sure they're clearly communicated to as to when they start their um, regular anticoagulation again. Um, so to help with some of these issues, if we move to the next slide, please, um, within our organisation at UHCW, we have a referral pathway for higher risk um, patients on anticoagulation. So most of the time, our main anticoagulation guideline has clear um, guidance for the low and moderate risk thrombosis patients and the best way to manage their anticoagulation around procedures. Um, it follows the similar guidance from the ICH in terms of the bleeding risk of the procedure and that alongside the DOAC and their renal function. Usually most of patients fall into that category. And then we have the higher risk of patients. So those that are very high risk for thrombosis or they've got a particularly complex past medical history or maybe they're having um, procedures um, where they might have one procedure at one point and then they either do to have something else very soon afterwards. They're often the type of patients our pre-op nurses would refer into our um, thrombosis MDT. So on a weekly basis, we'd review these high risk patients. So taking into account the full details of their history, in particular, their VTE history. So when the last event was, what were the circumstances around that? What's their current man management? If they're an AF patient, making sure we've got a clear history, including their Chad's vascular as as we've alluded to before, the Chad's vascular can indicate if whether you might need bridging and your thrombosis risk as well. And then as we've said before, making sure we've got a clear idea about not just that they've got a mechanical heart valve, but which valve it is, what type, how old it is, so we can again assess that risk on there as well. So with this information between our MDT, which usually involves a haematology consultant, a specialist pharmacist, and the anticoagulation nurses, we would have we have a set format in terms of how we write our plans. So we'd provide some clear guidance for the preoperative management. So very clear in terms of number of days stopping your dough out beforehand. As Catherine said, with warfarin, making a much clearer plan, often a, a day by day guide for the kind of five days pre op. Say this day it's this warfarin, this day it's no warfarin, at, but this day is nothing at all. This day is your low molecular weight heparin, and making very clear when the last dose is versus when the procedure is planned. And then the, often the post operative bit at as we said, is a bit more subjective in terms of it needs to involve the surgical team and their assessment of the patient's hemostasis after the procedure. So we generally give some, some guidance based on what information we're given about the procedure, but we can't give a definitive, you, you should always start at 48 hours or you should always start at 24 hours because it does require that assessment from the surgical team in terms of has the procedure gone as expected? As Catherine said before, has it change to a more invasive or a higher bleeding risk procedure during the operation and it's really important that that more recent input is there before the final decision about restarting the anticoagulation is made. So hopefully that gives you a little um, insight into how we manage some of the higher risk patients around surgery at our hospital. Thank you. That's the last slide. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, very interesting. I had a few questions myself, but I will, uh, I will, uh, if that's okay. Um, I think Catherine and Rose and Alice, you've seen there's a few questions um, in um, in the chat uh, bit. Um, if we start perhaps with the question from Sue, uh, which was regarding the responsibility of restarting the anticoagulation. I think uh, Catherine, you you touched base on that. Um, yeah, I've just seen your questions, Sue. I think um, I, I understand the um, the issues really. I think we we our, our surgeons also sometimes don't feel confident. We a bit like Alice has talked about. We tend to put a bit of a we would recommend once he, once hemostasis is secure and and things that we would do this that we would recommend this. But obviously, you know, it, it's their ultimate decision because we've not been in the surgery and, and we're recommending something before. So it should be them on recommending restarting. It should be in the post-op notes and then that should be followed by the team on the ward. But um, yeah, it's it's difficult 
to to manage that from from you know from uh, the anticoagulant side because you don't know when this you know, exactly what's happened but you know we can give some advice and often they say you know you're not told us what to do and like that's because we're not in the surgery it's got to be them that make a decision and whether if that decision is give a prophylactic dose of anoxaparin six hours post procedure and then get some advice that's okay but it's about having that original you know letting the nursing staff know what time do you want to give them the prophylaxis what you're waiting to have a look at you know to, to make sure it's okay to give the prophylaxis you know for things like um alice talked about those often some heavy bleeding isn't there with TURBTs or anything to do with a bladder there's often quite a lot of hematuria so when are they happy with with giving it and I think obviously some said some teams are more confident with that than others so orthopedics are usually pretty spot on you know what know what they're looking for in terms of strike throughs and things for wanting them to give them a hot withhold the lemon like heparin but definitely think it's the surgeon's responsibility about when to restart if they need some help then Obviously, different hospitals have different systems, as we've talked about, and our haematologists, if you know, if they've got a concern, would be happy to give that advice. We can give general advice, but it is the surgeon's responsibility on when to restart because they're the ones that have done the operation, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, can, can I ask you, uh, the, the, the three of you really, how do you document your, your advice? Because obviously there is a medical legal uh, input at some point for, for cases when things go wrong and we all have different places where we can document our advice. What, what is in practice the place where you document your interventions or your advice? Okay. For our patients that are referred through our referral pathway, we have the MDT referral response. So there's electronic documentation of our advice. Um, so we would always put a clear plan for the, the pre-op and the post-op side. And it's clear that it's based on the information provided in the referral as well. Sometimes we have to reject a referral because the information is just simply not sufficient to make a, an accurate judgment or decision on. So our hospital is a specialist centre for like neurosurgery and some other areas. So sometimes the patients from out of area. So we don't always have on the electronic system as much information as we need. So we can't find that information ourselves. So often we would send the referral back as well. So I think it's important if you've not got enough information you need to ask the right questions mm. so you can make a an evidence-based decision absolutely yeah. <clears throat> sorry just to add to that i yeah totally agree with that we do the same with um, uh, our performance being on an electronic system but also i think it's important that hey we, we if we, we don't reject a referral we're just asking for more information so that we can make a decision i think there's a temptation to say we don't know this patient so they ask the gp to do it or the surgeon to do it but actually we are the specialist yeah, we are the specialists, and actually, we we need to provide the advice. We want it done properly, I think. Um, but obviously, we need the right information because we won't yeah. always know the patient's background. Yeah, so similar to, to Ros and Alice, we will put a clinical note on the patient system um, or if we're trying to um, let the GP know as well, they'll obviously put things into a letter so that it goes electronically to them and, and what we've given a patient. But yeah, I think it's important to document, but also as Alice said, so we also are a, a specialist centre for lots of things and have lots of patients from all over the place and it's difficult often to um, to find all the information. It's also difficult sometimes to find someone that will prescribe the bridging if they're out of area. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and that because not all centres have pre-assessment clinics, bridging clinics, anticoagulant clinics that, that can do that. So that becomes a bit harder as well. Patients don't obviously want to come, you know, two hours drive just mm. to pick up some anoxaparin. So managing that um, is just really clearly documenting what, what we want into the GP so that they can they can prescribe and, and ensuring the patients had a discussion. Obviously, face-to-face -face is, is so much easier for these things if we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clear documentation of, of the plan on our electronic systems. It's good. So following on this, we got a, a question from Sana. It's regarding the, the, the competency or uh, how comfortable nurses are to, uh, to advise patients on where to stop and restart uh, their anticoagulation. And if we can widen that uh, so I think to warfarin, but widen to Dovax as well. Um, Catherine, um, Rose? Yeah, so, that, I'll, so we have varying <laughs> uh, confidence and um, around this. So our endoscopy nurses seem to be quite happy about giving advice around stopping things. Patients that need bridging tend to come to the antiquated clinic so we would do it there anyway but they're 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 happy with their within their guidance to do that um i think we've had more nervousness from a pre-assessment nurses because they feel especially if they've made 
they're having to read the guidance and then relate it to the patient, they're feeling they're making a clinical decision and often they need some support with, with that. So they will come to the pharmacist. Um, I think if it's well documented, you know, we can't get through to the patient. I think if it's well documented, I think the nurses would, you know, feel confident to read off something that we had recommended. I think it's that bit around the, who makes that decision. And some of the nurses obviously won't feel confident or, or won't be competent to make that decision and need that support. So I think it, it depends on the hospital, I would imagine, and the area as well. Um, and, and training, we've done quite a lot with our pre-assessment nurses, to, especially around DOAX. Then go, you follow the guidance, that's what you're doing. You know, there's a guideline there, it says stop there. Your surgeon said, need to stop DOAX as per guideline, it's fine for you to be able to then give that information because you're just following what's being asked. But I think, yeah, the confidence around that and the feeling of clinical responsibility is difficult. So um, probably obviously need some uh, support for them at that point. I suppose it's about as well, um, not assuming that they know that the, there is a guideline because we know there is a guideline, but they don't necessarily know. So it's for us to, to feed them the guidelines in a, in a digestible format, isn't it? Um, excellent. And do, do you have a standardized letter for um, for warfarin and, and bridging or non-bridging? Yeah, because yeah. that that's, has to be a written um, a written advice, isn't it? I think as per nice. Um, excellent. Yeah. Uh, we had the third question, and that was from from Mice, um, and this was was a bit longer. Uh, it was re regarding patients who have um, a low risk of bleeding. And uh, when the, he's got a vascular team who tells them that uh, because they are high risk of uh, of clotting and low risk of of uh, of bleeding, they still want to bridge a, a patient on DOAX. So, what would be your your advice for him on uh, on how to deal with that? I think we probably have a couple of our vascular surgeons that maybe feel the same way. So, I think it varies depending on the individual surgeon as to their preference and. I guess what level of bleeding risk or otherwise they they're happy to take when they're undertaking the procedure so I think probably we've had a couple of patients where they might have had a prophylactic dose in between but I don't think it's with strong evidence to support it at all um, but I think if if the surgeon's happy with the bleeding risk in that time period then I guess it's there in individual I guess judgment and decision to make that it's not something that we would usually recommend. No I agree with that um, completely and also I think the general move and the guidance and and evidence is away from over bridging mm. because there is evidence that it does increase the risk of bleeding. I do understand the concern of individual practitioner consultants Around, I guess they're thinking of it always from or more from the thrombotic point of view. This is their patients, their vascular patients. And certainly that's true of mechanical heart valves as well. I think the cardiothoracic surgeons are very cautious about not bridging in those patients. And you can totally understand why, because they will see um, when, the, when they do thrombose and cause strokes or whatever. Um, but I do think we have to be quite cautious because people are undergoing procedures and we do, you know, it is partly down to the individual surgeon and what what bleeding risk they're willing to accept but at the end of the day we want to keep the patients as safe as possible yeah, i agree i am um, i think when we've had issues with that the surgeons tend to say i know how to manage bleeding but i don't know how to manage a stroke and and that feels to them a bigger thing doesn't it i think if they have a patient that has a stroke or clots after surgery um is is feels often bigger to them than, than bleeding because they often have bleeding in surgery and, and know how to manage it. I think it's really interesting those that ask for bridging with a DOAC because it always makes me think, well, you just come to do the DOAC a bit longer than if you're happy with a certain level of anticoagulation. And I guess as we learn more about DOACs, you know, I know they've been out quite a while now, then we might feel more comfortable on continuing those a bit longer prior to certain surgeries if you don't mind bleeding. Um, you know, if, you, if you're more worried about the, the thrombotic risk, I guess. Um, so, and also, you know, as you said, Alice, you know, the sort of VT prophylaxis, we've just had a similar thing where the, they've wanted to give the patient VT prophylaxis after coming off a DOAC. I suppose that isn't bridging, it's VT prophylaxis, isn't it? So I suppose, that, you know, if they were coming into hospital, they'd have get, got that. Um, and, you know, it is them that's taking them to theatre, I suppose. So unless there's something obviously dangerous about what they're trying to do, I suppose it's supporting, well, talking to them about the, about the issues and coming up with a plan with them that everybody can, can manage and going to, uh, we've got a very 
a big group of vascular surgeons and they will have different ways of managing things so it's you know going to talk to them at their governance meetings and things around issues and and coming up with plans I was you'll usually have a good discussion around it if we need some support and uh, so talking to them what are their issues what can we do and actually you know if you're gonna if you want to give full bridging and they're on a DOAC then you know is there something about continuing the DOAC a bit longer so you don't need to do that because actually it's quite a lot of work as well and people don't like injecting them. Mm. Uh, and in fact, uh, I don't know what you think, but I think it's, it's quite useful to use these cases afterwards to to try to discuss with them at their specialty meetings, yeah. rather than than talk to about bread and butter, which they do correctly. Is take these patients for which there was a big discussion and and use them as a as a uh, as a consensus at the specialty meetings. Uh, at least there is a, a another question from Sana regarding mm. your 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 VT patient, Mr. VT. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can answer this one. Um, I think we said in this scenario, if the patient has some bleeding still after the procedure, we wouldn't start a therapeutic dose of anticoagulation, whether that was the um, the DOAC that were originally on or the therapeutic dose for noxaparin. Um, in terms of if you would ever, if they're on a DOAC before and then move to therapeutic noxaparin, I guess if during the procedure they'd found significantly more cancer or then they might, rather than restart a DOAC, some areas might not be confident using a DOAC in different cancers so I guess that might be the only scenario where if this patient was on a DOAC pre-op and then they move to therapeutic and oxyparin afterwards it might be in a situation related to um, metastases or other extension of the cancer I don't think there'll be many other scenarios where mm -hmm. you would move from a DOAC to the full therapeutic dose of an oxyparin post-op. And in these cases I don't know how how easy or complicated you find it to 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 remain patient centric and to engage with the patient yeah. in these discussions because it does become very technical, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think particularly maybe with some of the anticoagulation in cancer patients, it's really important to remember the patient at at that point because often people are more familiar with using therapeutic like low molecular weight heparins, but the evidence for using DOACs in certain cancer patients is increasing and for the overall patient experience, I'm sure most people would say they'd rather take a tablet twice a day than inject themselves twice a day. Mm. So it's like you say, having that discussion with the patient in using language and terminology that they understand so they can make their own choice about the risk of whether they have a DOAC or low molecular weight heparin if they happen to be unfortunately have cancer and thrombosis. Mm. Uh, we also have uh, Nyango who's, uh, who's, who's asking about the uh, the dose when we bridge. I think Catherine, do you want to uh, repeat? You you didn't mention it in your chat, you know, about the the, the dose of when you yeah, what we mean by bridging. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, so yeah, thanks for the question. So yeah, if we're bridging, and I think the ACCP is quite good at this. Bridging is is full dose uh, uh, low molecular -like heparin. Um, so if a patient requires bridging pre-procedure, then they require bridging post-procedure. But as Alice and, and Rosa both talked about, obviously the bleeding risk immediately post-procedure is high. So we wouldn't normally go in with full dose low molecular -like heparin straight away. We'd start with a prophylactic dose. Sometimes here in Leeds, we like a bit of BD dosing, you know, just to inject the patient more than once a day. Um, so we might do a prophylactic dose six hours post-procedure. The next day we might do BD prophylaxis and, and sort of step it up. I think Alice talks about sort of 40, 72 hours post-procedure before you were back onto full anticoagulation. And obviously that's procedure dependent, patient dependent as well. So yeah, if they've, if they've required bridging before the procedure, they do need to go back onto full um, bridging post-procedure but at a safe time and then continue that until the INR is in range or wherever you want it for those with a higher target so we normally stop at two for a 2.5 target and about two, 2.5 for anyone with a sort of higher target really because you don't really want a good uh, good going INR of three plus an oxaparin or then like what heparin obviously increases the risk of bleeding so make sure you know the patient's being followed up appropriately with at their clinic but yes if they need bridging before they do need it afterwards but not straight afterwards and when that hemostasis is secure is the phrase I think they like to use in hematology terms. Excellent so that, um, that I think that, that we are reaching now at the end of uh, our presentation and uh, uh, of course so we, we can just take here within this question quickly about the bridging at one one milligram per kilo 1.5 milligrams per kilo do you want to finish on that one? Yeah. 
We t- this is for an octoporin, presumably. We tend to use yep. 1.5 mg per kilo mm-hmm. once a day, Same except here. for valves where we use 1 mg per kilo twice a day, but I think that's very variable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Makes generally sense. we'd be similar. Most of the yeah. time, the once daily dose, just because it's more patient friendly and more likely if you're just doing something Easier, once a day, hopefully you do it right. Rather than if you do it mm-hmm. twice a day and get do it wrong both times, it's probably a bit mm-hmm. riskier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, completely agree. And that's not only for male patients, is it? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That was very useful. Um, and I will uh, reiterate that if you've got more questions, you can ask them uh, uh, through the chat or probably through the UKCPA forums. Uh, thank you to Thrombosis UK for having us. And thank you for UKCPA to support us. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.